to be in the house of the Lord this morning. First Corinthians chapter number 6 is where we are. Trying to go through this book and do our study. God sure is good to us. He's blessed us abundantly this morning. Give us health and strength to be able to be here. Sent some rain for us. Praise God. And uh, He knows what we need. If it was up to us, the earth would be shriveled up and dead already. But I'm just glad that God is in control and man does not have the answer. But we got the Word of God this morning. Yes. And that's all we need. Don't need anything else. The child of God doesn't need nothing out there. We need to be in His house, sitting at His feet, and hearing His Word as Mary did. Not to be like Martha, cumbered about with all kinds of things, but to be there at Jesus' feet and listening to His Word. This morning, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, last week we got down... Around verse number 16, talking about, know, what, know ye not that which is joined to an harlot is one body for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And here Paul's trying to differentiate to these Corinthian believers that you need to stop walking in the flesh and start walking in the Spirit. Right. When you get saved and born again, you got a new nature. Amen. Praise God for that. I mean, yeah. the Bible said, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Amen. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. And that's evidence of being saved. Right. Like we talked about last week, if a person gets saved, and you hear that a lot today because it permeates the entire of our country, this thing that is referred to by many names, which is an easy believ believism, one, two, three, pray after me, hey, uh, put on a tie, join a church. Those things do not get you into God's that's heaven. Right. Only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, the death, the preaching of the cross, the Bible says, is what God has chosen to save the lost. For by the foolishness of preaching is what it is. Not by singing, not by emotions or any of these things or working up the flesh. It's through the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost of God has to reprove a person of their sin. They have to understand that they have transgressed God's laws. They're guilty. Yes. There's no way that they can pay the payment. And then God, through His love, shows them Calvary. Yes. And they see the death, the burial, and the resurrection of God's Son. That's the only atonement that God accepts is the blood of His Son. Right. Yes. So if you don't have the blood applied to your soul, and, and, and when it comes down to time for death, the Hebrews 9.27 says it's the point unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment... If we stand before God without the blood of Jesus Christ on our soul, we will end up in hell. That's Amen. all there is. There ain't no other way. The Bible said, ye must be born again. That's what he told Nicodemus, a religious man. He tithed. He, he was faithful to the synagogue and all these things. He, he tried to observe the law. He was a religious man. But he was lost. Yes. <laughs> Jesus said, Art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? <laughs> See, because he knew things upon the outward appearance. He didn't understand that the man inside was born in sin, right. was dead in trespasses and sin, and had to be quickened by the Holy Ghost of God. And that is the new birth. Yeah, Ephesians 2 1 said, And you hath he quickened who were. Dead in trespasses and sins. Thank God we were dead, but now we're alive. Praise God. If you've been saved, you're alive this morning. But so Paul's telling them, look, all these problems that the Corinthian church had was not because of God, not because of the Spirit of God. It was because of yielding to the flesh. And that's one of the main things that I, I think that this church has tried to beat into us is that we have... To contend with the flesh. It is a fact of life for every child of God. Every day they get up, they have an enemy that they face in a mirror. And they have to deal with that. And the choice has to be made every day. Are you going to walk in the Spirit of God and let the Holy Ghost of God that abides within your bosom lead you and guide you according to this book? Or are you going to rebel against that and walk in the flesh? That's just, that's just all there is to it. And that's what happened over here. These people were believers. They were saved. Yeah, they were. 
There was fornication in the church. There was people going to law with one another in the church. Paul said all that is shameful. We ought not be taking each other up here to the courthouse and suing each other. We ought to get it settled in here. And we know, as we've, we've talked about, we went through it in Matthew 18. If you've got a problem with somebody, go to them. Face to face. Don't text them. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't call. Uh, go to them. Man to man. Woman to woman. Whatever it may be. And the Bible tells us how we're supposed to handle them things. But here's, Paul is specifically talking about the appetites of the flesh. In verse 13, it said, meats for the belly and belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Yes. And we know that the word of God teaches plainly that the earth and the works thereof, God will burn it. They're all going to burn. 1 John 2, 15-17 tells us these things. 2 Peter tells us these things. And tells us that all of these things are going to be destroyed. So what kind of person should we be? What manner of person should you be if you realize that the earth is going to burn? That means your job doesn't mean anything. That means all your physical possessions don't mean nothing. All them things are secondary to God for the Christian. God should have the preeminence. Yes, That's all there is to it. And if we put God in His place, everything else falls in line. If you put God first, you can do just like He said. Take no thought for your life. Don't worry about what you should eat or what you should put on. He said, for the Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Yes. If he takes care of all these little critters out here, and, and every squirrel you see, you never see a squirrel or any a uh, deer holding up a sign saying we'll work for food or anything like that. God opens his hand and feeds them all. He keeps the sun in its course, the moon in its course, the earth on its axis, uh, the right amount of oxygen's in the air. I mean, all these things God upholds by the word of his power, and yet some of us think that he cannot meet our needs. It's foolishness. God can do anything. Anything. He is not limited by anything. Whatsoever we ask Him according to His will, this book promises us that He will give it to us. And the Bible tells us, you have not because you ask not. And then you ask that you may consume it upon your own lust. Praying for yourself is not the same as praying in the will of God. Because a lot of the things that we ask for and God's will. They say, well, God didn't hear my prayer. He did, but he just said no. That's all there is to that. You know, what? the Bible teaches some very simple truths. If we go over, if you look over in Galatians, it tells us, that, hey, say not, or James, and them scriptures over there, it says, say not that we'll go into such and such a city and buy and sell and do for a year and get gain. The Bible says you ought to say, if the Lord's willing, then we should live. Because if God don't allow you to live, you won't do anything. You're going to go into a hole in the ground. You won't do nothing. But it, he said, if he's willing, then we'll do this or that. Yeah. And man, I've tried to put that in practice in my life, and it works out good. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we say, the Bible says, let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. Amen. And if somebody says, hey, will you come help me? You say, hey, if the Lord's willing and he lets me live, I'll, I'll do my best to be there. Sometimes we still fail, don't we? Things happen. Right. God knows the future. Yes. We do not. So therefore, we leave it in the Lord's hands. So he's trying to get them to walk in the Spirit. And he tells them here that we are members of Christ. And it says we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Ephesians 5.30, we talked about that last week. We read over there um, talking about being saved and born again. You don't wallow in sin for the rest of your life. You got a new nature. Things are different and you can look at the overall flow of a person's life. There are Christians who fall. Read about it in the Bible. Did David sin with Bathsheba? Did he get away with that? No. What did God do for David? He sent him a preacher. He sent him a man to tell him that he sinned. David knew that he sinned. But he hid it. He did not confess it. So God sent a man to him, Nathan the prophet, and told him this little story 
about a man with his little ewe lamb and a, another fellow got it and took it and it was, a, it was like to him a little child. And David being a shepherd, he was incensed over that. He went into a rage and said, this man's going to die. Yeah. And then what did Nathan say? Thou art the man. You did it, David. Immediately, David said, I sinned. God said, I have put away your iniquity. Amen. <laughs> Woo! But he said, you're going to pay. Galatians, like I said, Galatians chapter 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked whatsoever. Man soweth that shall he also reap. That's a principle for us to understand that you can't just do what you want to do. And God's going to just brush it under the rug? I don't think so. God's a holy God, a righteous God, a pure God. And He demands holiness. The only way we can have holiness is through that Holy Spirit, the new nature we got. But if we yield to the flesh, the body says, the Bible says that we will reap corruption. Is it going to be on the other side? Here. And it's life. The last 20 years of David's life was nothing but struggles and trials and sickness. The sword, he, the, God told him that the sword would not leave his house. It did not. Horrible things happened to David. But praise God, he's in heaven today. Yes. But see, these things were written for our examples, Paul tells us, right. so that we can look at them things and don't do them. Right. Don't do it. So here he says in verse in chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So it uses, when he's talking about if you yield your members to commit fornication, whether it's physically or spiritually, Spiritual adultery is putting things before God. Right. Idol worship. Did. Yes. That, Israel did it. did it. Lost everything. And they chose the world over God. A lot of Christians choose the world over God. Yes. To their own destruction. Yes. When you could have everything. Amen. All the goodness, the blessings of God just by doing simply what He says. That's all you got to do. I mean, you got a, a, an instruction list up here. If you're at work, if you just do steps one through ten, that thing is going to work out. But if you say, I don't like step three, I don't like it, I'm going to skip it, it ain't going to work out. If you got a recipe, you leave stuff out, somebody say, well, this don't taste right because you didn't follow the recipe. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. But if we do what God says, there's nothing going to be wrong. It's possible to walk in the Spirit and please God. The Bible says it is. Enoch did it. Enoch did it about 4,000 years ago. What's wrong with us? We got the whole word of God right here. My goodness gracious. We're, 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 we're worse off than the people of the Old Testament. We're, we're way worse off than they are. Because we have way more light than they got. So our responsibility and, and payment for what we do wrong is going to be greater than what they had to endure. That's the Bible. You ought to read the Word of God. That's what it says. And, but it says here that if, if we do those things, just like in Genesis 2.24 where the Lord said, man shall, or Adam was talking about Eve, said a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife and they yes. shall become one flesh. Right. And God instituted marriage. It's a man and a woman with children. That's it. Yeah. I don't care what the world says about it. I don't care what society says about it. Uh, it's so popular for people to say, well, we could just live together and do this. God is not in that. No. The Bible said, it is, be not unequally yoked. Amen. That doesn't mean that a black person can't be with a white person. It means that you, if you're saved, you cannot be with lost people. Right. You're not supposed to be marrying up with lost people. You're not supposed to be walking around with lost people and, and participating in the things they participate in. Amen. The Bible doesn't tell us to hate people. It tells us to love all men. Love our enemies. And do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. But it does tell us to separate ourselves. Amen. Come out from among them. Yeah. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Yeah. You won't hear that in a lot of churches. They say, it's okay if you dabble in sin. The Bible said a little leaven leaveneth at the whole lump. Yes. You, you cannot win over sinners by sinning. And, and, and the biggest excuse you hear for that is like, well, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Jesus is God. God cannot be tempted with evil. He cannot sin. So God can go anywhere and not be affected by sin. We can't do that. If you pour, if you have a clean glass and a dirty glass of water, if you pour 
the dirty water in the clean glass, it's going to make it dirty. If you pour the clean water in the dirty glass, it's going to still be dirty. Physically, it's impossible to clean yourself up. It's a supernatural thing that takes the blood of Jesus Christ and His Spirit to do it. That's why He can say, Come and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as wool. Can you make something that's red, white? No, God can. He done it if you're saved. But this morning, He says here, Flee, in verse 18, fornication. Flee it. And fornication is sin outside of wedlock yep. or any kind of sexual sin that's outside of marriage. Right. That's what it is. Yes. This world loves it. They, yeah, they, they say everything is all right. Every, every appetite that you got, indulge it. Feed it. Don't withhold anything from it. No. They, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. My goodness. Why do you think this country's in such a bad shape it is this morning? You don't know why it is? Because of sexual immorality and perversion. That is what caused almost every historical nation and society to fall is because of their immorality and their perversion. It got so wicked and vile, God destroyed them. We talk about, the, and it, not only that, but the sins of sodomy and all this ungodly filth. The Bible says it's an abomination. Yeah. It's abomination. The world wants us to accept it. Yeah, right. they, they're teaching our kids that it's all right. Yeah, all right. If you read this book right here, it ain't all right. That's right. It's a sin. It's an yeah. abomination. Yeah. It's against nature. It is. Oh, now notice here. He says the flea fornication. The only way for us to, to keep from sin is to stay away from it. Yeah. You cannot be around sin and, and, and expect it not to in, you know, bother you or to eventually invade. You, you cannot. That's why the Bible said evil communications corrupt good manners. Uh, what fellowship hath the child of God with an infidel? What fellowship hath light with darkness? Have no fellowship with them, proof of works of darkness. See, and then people say, well, yeah, that's true. But the Bible says you are to reprove them. Say that it's wrong. If somebody asks you a direct question, I've heard these big so-called preachers on TV and they will ask them point blank period right to their face on live TV. Is homosexuality a sin? I'm not the judge. The Word of God says it's an abomination. That's the answer. That's the answer. Yeah, it's an, that's the answer. But praise God, you can be saved. You can get out of it. The Bible said in Corinthians, such were some of you. All this laundry list of wicked and vile sins. Paul said, look, this, this Corinthian uh, what a culture or society was so depraved and wicked and vile. It's just like our day. Rome was like that. I mean, all these nations, they were known for their sexual perversion and immorality. That's why God said, you can't be like them nations. Do not like these other nations do. I'll give you, the, I'll give you a list of things you guys ought to do. Forget about them. <laughs> don't worry about them don't marry their daughters don't give your sons to their daughters don't intermingle with them they will be a thorn in your flesh yes. you read the Old Testament and that's exactly what happened the church of our modern day is yoking up with the world and the church has become worldly they have opened the door and let the devil in we need some walls of separation to keep them out and to keep us in. This is it right here. You, you walk in the light of this book. That's all you need. That's all you need. So in Genesis chapter 39, we got a story right in the very beginning of the Bible. A man named Joseph who was sold into slavery and ended up in Potiphar's house down in Egypt. And his wife... Tried to seduce him. She, could, she kept catching him alone. And trying to say, hey, come and lie with me. The master is out of the house. And Joseph, Joseph probably was around 17, 18 years old. Around that time, roughly. I don't know exactly. But what, what I'm saying is this young man was so godly. That he told this woman, he said, how can I sin against the master of the house and do this wicked sin? And sin against God. Yeah. 
What did he do? He ran away. Literally fled. That's why Paul's saying flee. If you see something that can tempt you, get away from it. That's, that's the way to deal with it. Flee from it. The Bible said, and Timothy said to flee youthful lust. Get away from them. You put yourself in a situation and, and people will say, well, I, I couldn't help it. Yeah, you could because you chose to be where you were. You chose to watch what you watch. You chose to hear what you hear. You chose to go where you go. You and I are responsible for our actions. When we stand before God, we ain't going to say, so-and-so made me do it. If if so-and-so wouldn't have been there, I wouldn't have did that. When God would say, well, if you wouldn't have been there, you wouldn't have done it. See, that's the thing about it. So we got to flee from them things. So Paul tells us that, plain as day. In the first book of the Bible, we learned the lesson to get away from it. And it tells us here in 19... Right here it says, Every sin, in verse 18, that a man doeth is without the body. So if you steal something, if you lie, or if you hurt somebody, all them things are without the body, but you commit fornication, you're sinned against your own flesh. Yes, and a lot of times it brings disease. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what it says, bring corruption in your own yeah. body. Yeah. And it tells us here, But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? He's asking you a question. Paul's just asking this rhetorical question. He obviously knows the answer to it. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Mm -hmm. If you're saved and born again this morning, you have the Holy Ghost yeah. of God abiding in your bosom. Praise the Lord. That is one of the mysteries the Bible talks about in the book of Colossians. It says, Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's one of the things the Jew couldn't understand. They had trouble with that. Knowing that God would come down and He would dwell in the person of the Holy Ghost inside of the believer. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that was ever talked about in the Old Testament. Because it was a mystery. That's why Paul said it was a mystery. But notice here it says, Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. No Christian has the right to say, I'm my own man. That's right. I do what I want to do. Amen. What I do don't bother nobody else. I beg to differ with you this morning. What you do as a child of God affects every one of your brothers right. and sisters. Right. It affects That's everybody it. in your family. Right. You ask a drug addict and say, hey, I'm not hurting anybody. Ask his mom. Yeah. Ask their dad. Ask their brothers and sisters, their wife, their children, and all their friends and family. Does it affect them? Yes, it does. Yeah. Sin is like a, a rock thrown into a pond. It, the, the effects go farther than we can imagine. Amen. Even through generations of time, That's right. sin affects people. The Bible says that God would visit the iniquity of the fathers up to the third and the fourth generations. Have you not seen generations of people, families, that refuse to deal with sin and it destroys their kids go on and do it? Their kids do it, and it's just this cycle that just keeps going. They just slip right off into hell. Nobody wants to do anything about it. But then, praise God, maybe down the line somebody gets saved and born again. And starts teaching their family about God. And changes them things. But you can't make people get saved. All you can do is give them the remedy. And it's up to them to choose it. But it tells you, for ye are bought... With a price. Yes. It costs the Son of God all. Yeah. <laughs> it's free to us, praise God. Yeah. You know why it's free? Because we couldn't afford it. Yeah. Right. I couldn't afford one drop of the Savior's blood. No, no. Not one. But He said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God did it. It's a gift. Yes. The, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. We can't, even, we can't even say thanks enough to God for what He's done. He saved us from hell and our own destruction. He said, now therefore, knowing all these things, knowing you're bought with a price, you ain't your own, you got the indwelling of the Holy Ghost of God, you got everything you need to, to survive in this life and to overcome evil, to walk in victory. You got all these things, He says, and so instead of feeding your fleshly appetite, Use your body for what it was made for. To glorify God. 
in your spirit and your body, which are God's. They ain't yours. Right. Dale, your body ain't yours. It ain't, my body ain't mine. Right? right? I want to read some scriptures to you this morning. Genesis 2, 7. The Bible said, And God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So he took a pile of dirt and made man. And if you read over in Psalm 24, 1, it tells us, that the earth and the inhabitants thereof are God's. Everything. Everything that you set your little beady eyes on this morning, God owns it. And even the eyes you're looking with, they're His. He owns them. He owns me. He owns you. He owns every lost sinner out here. He owns every saved person. He owns everything. It's His. Psalm 50 is one of my favorites. Because he said, if I needed something, I would not ask you because everything is mine. Right. It's mine. I mean, and the child of God rejoices in that. Amen. We rejoice to know Amen. that everything's God's because there's some squatters in this world that think they own everything. Mm -hmm. The devil thinks he owns everything. Right. God's going to boot him off into the lake of fire and we're going to set up camp right. with the Savior. Ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. And then after all that's over, his kingdom will have no end. We're going to go to a city known as New Jerusalem. It's going to come down out of God, out of heaven. John saw it. Yes, Coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. That's our, that's our destination, folks. That's where we're headed. So our minds and our thoughts daily should be on heavenly things. Amen. Not the earth. Not saying, boy, I wish a Republican would get in the White House. How many Republicans have been in the White House have been lost and went to hell? How many Democrats? There's this, we cannot change the world by our vote. People literally think that if they write something on a piece of paper that's going to change the world. The only way to change the world is to change the hearts of men. Through the preaching of the gospel of the right. grace of God. And let God make him a new creature. We can't do nothing with man. We couldn't do nothing with ourselves. God had to do it. But he tells us that God owns all of it. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. It said, God said, all souls are mine. Mine. The soul that sinneth it shall die. That's what it says. Hey. Uh, a sinner dies without God, they go to hell. The world don't want to hear that truth. But it is the truth. Yes, it is. Whether it's your loved one or mine, God does not, no respect to a person. He requires everyone to come through His Son. Right. If they don't, they will die in their sin and they will go to hell. That's all there is to it. They don't have to. They don't have to. That's what the church is here doing to proclaim the good message saying, hey, there's a way out of hell. And His name is Jesus. The cross of Calvary. That's the way we are to do. That's our, that's our mind process are to be in this life is to walk upright, to eschew evil, to, to be worshiping God in spirit and truth day in and day out. Not just on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night or one Sunday a month. Every day of our life. Because being saved is not a hobby. It's not some club that we're in. It's life itself. Yes, it, is. it is our life. Yes. Like he said, this, like Brother Steve said, this right here, this is our life. This book is our life. Yes. We can stop eating and die, but if we stop eating this, we're going to shrivel up spiritually and be like the salt. They say, hey, when the salt has lost its savor, it ain't worth nothing. To be tossed over the shoulder and trodden under the feet of men. We, if we don't have any spiritual power, we are no good to this world. Period. So he tells us that also, and also in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, he said that the, and then shall the earth return back to the dust and the spirit will return to God who gave it. See, God owns the body. He owns the soul. He owns the spirit. He owns hell. He owns heaven. He owns all of the three heavens, the third heaven, the second heaven, the first heaven. He owns the universe, every atom that's in it. He owns all of it. So we don't have anything to boast in. No, we, we can brag in the blood and say we're a child of the king and say by the grace of God and give all honor and glory to him. Amen. But 
The only way to avoid these issues that are in the Corinthian church is to yield to God, to obey His Word, and to walk in His Spirit. There's no other way to do that. We have to do it. Let's look real quick at John chapter 16 and verse number 7. The Bible says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Don't you like that the Lord tells us the truth? It is expedient for you that I go away. This is the Lord talking to His disciples. You imagine hearing this from the Son of God. I wouldn't want Him to go away, would you? The disciples sure didn't want Him to go away. But He told them, He said, It's expedient for you, not for me, but for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send Him unto you. <laughs> Praise God. Don't you know the Lord doesn't say, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He gives us assurance right off the bat and says, I'm going to send you the Comforter. That's right. He's going to comfort you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. And He said, and when He's come, He will reprove the world of sin. When a person gets under old time Holy Ghost conviction, it's the Holy Ghost of God that is reproving that person of their own sin and showing them that they are a sinner. You cannot get saved if you do not know you are lost. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in this world. That's one of His threefold works that you read about in this Scripture right here. And also look over in Romans chapter number 8. The Bible tells us a wonderful truth here for the Christian. So you get reproved of your sin. The Bible, Jesus said, No man cometh unto me except my Father which sent me draw him. So it tells him right here. When you get saved and born again, you're reproved of your sin. You believe the gospel. You repent. You're saved. You're washed in the blood. You're, you're baptized into the family of God through the operation of the Holy Spirit of God. You're made a new creature. And the Bible tells us that you are made in habitation of God. Through the Spirit in Ephesians 2, 20-22, it tells us that God cleans us up and makes us a habitation for Him. Amen. He comes and abides in That's us. Right. That's why it feels so good when you hear the good old time preaching. The Holy Ghost starts moving and your soul just starts rolling and you just want to hey, praise God and shout and cry and laugh and everything else. Because God's so good. And we have the presence of His Holy Spirit in us all the time. Yeah. He can be grieved. Yes, he, can. he can be quenched. Yes, he, he can be resisted. Yeah. The Holy Ghost of God is easily offended, folks. Right. If, we don't, if, if He's not in our services, then we're doing everything in vain. Yeah. It's yeah. nothing. Yeah. If God doesn't build the house, the builders build in vain. That's what the Bible said. If you have not the spirits, you're none of mine, God said. Without the spirits, you can do nothing. Romans 8, 9. What does that say right there? Plain as day, it says, so then, they that are, but verse 8 says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So were the Corinthians pleasing God? Ain't possible. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And there's people that will say, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm waiting on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no, you ain't. No, you're not. If you're saved, you got it. There is no such thing as waiting on the Holy Ghost after you got saved. The Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, what does that say? He's none of his. If you ain't got the Holy Ghost, then you're lost. That's what this scripture says. And it says, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Praise God for that. Now look at verse 14. For as many as are led... So we got, we're dwelt by the Spirit. We also are led by the Spirit. We don't lead the Spirit around. We don't, we don't tell God where we're going to go, what we're going to do. We let God tell us. He said, you're led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We got the witness in ourselves. No one has to tell me, David, that I'm saved. No one can. If I've got to tell you you're saved, that's a problem. That's a problem. Let me look here at 1 John real quick. 
the book of 1 John. Chapter number 5, I believe it is. 1 John 5. Pages are sticking together. First John chapter number 5 verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Notice this right here. For this is the witness of God, which he testifies of the Son. He that believeth on the Son of God, what does that say? Hath the witness in himself. And it's using the word specifically in, inside. The Holy Ghost bears witness with our spirit, what we just read, that we are. Not that we're going to be. Not that we're working and striving to get to it. We are the children of God. When you get born again, you're a child of God. You're a joint heir of Jesus Christ and an heir of God. You've got an inheritance that's incorruptible, reserved in heaven. Your name is recorded. And it can't be blotted out. God ain't going to do that. You cannot be unborn. That's just a fact of life. Spiritually and physically. So let's look at Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 30. Boy, I love this chapter right here. Praise God, it's so good. And the Bible said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. What does the last part of that say? Whereby ye are what? Sealed. God puts a seal on His own. That's why He says, He knoweth them that are His. He calleth them by name, George. The Bible said, I am known of my sheep. They follow me and another they will not follow. So if a person claims to be saved and you're saved and we're trying to follow this book and they're doing something opposite of this book, something's wrong there. Because the Bible said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. Not I am a way. I'm not a way for you. I am the way. One and only. So there's only one way to go. Now there may be differences and doctrinal things where our, our understanding and our ignorance of the scriptures. But you ain't going to come up to me and say, hey, I'm saved and I don't believe in the virgin birth. I'm saved and I don't believe in the blood atonement. I'm saved and I don't believe in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved and I don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. You cannot do that. Those are cardinal doctrines of the Word of God. If, if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, we don't have a Savior. He would be just another man. But He wasn't a man. He's God. The Bible tells us that. But this is the thing. When you get saved and born again, you got the Holy Ghost abiding in you. Amen. That's a glorious truth. Yeah. It's a wonderful truth to know that. We're different than the world. They're walking in darkness. We're children of light. We got the truth right here, don't we, brother? When you read this book, it's not just a book. It's on a shelf in a library somewhere. This is God's Word. This is holy and true. This is a revelation from heaven itself to mankind. This is the most glorious thing that a man could ever digest into his body yes. is this book right here. It, without this, we don't know anything about God. No, without this, we don't know that we're a sinner. No, we without this, we don't know that we need, to, we need to get saved. We don't know we're headed for a devil's hell. We don't know these truths. But God said that He would send truth to us. He came. He manifested the Father to the world. But if you read from Genesis all the way to Revelation, there's never, ever, 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 ever been a time when there wasn't somebody that God had on this earth telling mankind His requirements. From Adam all the way to the end. Even through the Great Tribulation, there'll be people, I mean, there'll be angels flying back and forth preaching the everlasting gospel. There'll be 144,000 witnesses. There'll be the two witnesses. I mean, there, there, there is going to be someone telling people about Jesus. Because he's the focal point of this book. He is the, the object of the Father's love. Without him, we, we're going to end up in hell. We've got to have the Son of God. That's what this book teaches us. And that's what Paul is telling the Corinthian believers. If you'll put God where he's supposed to be, you'll be all right. Yeah. But if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. 
And it's going to bring a lot of trouble in the church for your brothers and sisters. And most of all for you and I. The Bible said, why say that you love me? And do not the thing that I say. Hope you got some out of that this morning. God bless you.